Matt, appreciate that. As, as, as the world turns, you know, we're just trying to, to deal with it here. So uh, be patient with us. And you have. God bless you guys. Good to, good to be with you tonight. There in your homes, make sure you're preparing for communion. We'll be taking communion um, at the end of the service. We'll be doing that until we can gather again uh, on a Wednesday night. And we'll get back to our, our normal schedule. Tonight, 1 Kings chapter 10. Uh, we've uh, entitled this message, The Queen Visits the King. The Queen and Kings here. And uh, let's pray and ask God to bless our study. Father, we, we thank you, God, for gathering us here today. We thank you for those who are tuning in, whether it's live or uh, whether it's 3 a.m. or whenever they would, would uh, view this, uh, this service. We, we do ask that you would bless Bless them, Lord God, and, and God, just, uh, we just give it all to you, Lord. All that's going on, Lord, and uh, we just, you're so good to us. You see us through all things, and so we just want to honor you and praise you and thank you, God. Um, we do pray for the sick. We pray for those who are in the hospital, those who uh, we've been praying for, Lord God, those who uh, are widows, Lord God, uh, the, the, those who are uh, just going through some difficult situations tonight. Father, you know their names, you know the situations. Uh, we just lift them up to you and ask for your hand upon them, Lord. Uh, thank you for gathering us here or online, and, and thank you that we can open your word. And we ask that you teach us tonight, for it is in Jesus' name we ask, and all the households said, Amen. Amen. Well, we come to an interesting chapter tonight. Chapter 10, uh, where Solomon welcomes a visitor from Sheba, the queen herself, as we said. And this visit, this chapter really, for the most part, most of these verses, uh, play an important part uh, and uh, speak great truth, but plays an important part in the New Testament as we will bring it out tonight tonight, and how our Lord uh, referenced this visit, how our Lord referenced uh, the visit of this queen to Solomon, and utilized it really, as I see, a very convicting um, illustration to those of his own, of whom he came to save, and um, this will be a, a, just a great time tonight. I, I pray that you get much out of it. Let's uh, ponder it. Let's uh, look at it and study it. And I pray that God will be speaking to you as he has spoken to me. In verse 1, it says in chapter 10 of First Kings, Now when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him. With hard questions. <laughs> I, I, I like that. She came to test him with hard questions. But the first thing we read is that she heard. She heard of the fame of Solomon. Someone shared with her. Somehow the information got to her all the way down there in Sheba. And she's responding to what she has heard. Queen of Sheba really becomes a seeker, and that's a good thing, and we will point this out, but here she comes from Sheba. Ethiopians, though, claim the queen is theirs, (laughs) that that the queen here spoken of is part of their heritage, but archaeologists and historical sources document a kingdom of Saba, which is Sheba. Uh, Sheba is in English, or for us, uh, during biblical times in Arabia, which would be modern-day Yemen. So most scholars point that this queen came from uh, Arabia rather than from um, Ethiopia. But please notice again, guys, that the fame of Solomon came to her, and she wanted to come and test him with hard questions. And 
it's interesting that I love it. It says, the fame of Solomon concerning, don't miss that, underline this, the name of the Lord. Concerning the name of the Lord. The fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord. That's what drew her interest. I truly believe. Not so much that there was a wise man as king over Israel. But the fact is that scripture tells us it was this name of the Lord. That's what drew her interest. Was the Lord God behind Solomon's fame and wisdom. And this builds upon each other, uh, one upon another, as we walk through these verses. Just like us before coming to Christ, we sought out to know more about Jesus. Uh, Maybe from what others shared of their relationship with the Lord, even from our own family's faith in Jesus. Every man must be a seeker. And go on that journey. For some of us, it was very short. It was just truth shared. It was in the home. It was exampled. And when they came to that crossroads, it was easy to receive Christ as their Savior. Other of us have had harder times. We wanted to test the world, and the world tested us, really. And we were rode hard and put away wet. But it was through those times that we started to seek after this Christ, this Jesus, of whom many have spoken into us. And when we sought, when we became that searcher, we found what we were looking for. And maybe some of you are still searching tonight. And friend, I will tell you, the search can be over. Your searching can be over tonight by just receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If in this chaos and in these crazy times that we're living in, COVID and, and the, uh, just the, the rioting that are going on, if you don't see that you need the Lord during these times, then you need to uh, just continue to read the Word of God and, and you need to get on your face because He's the answer to all of this. Jeremiah 29, 13 would tell us in speaking for the Lord, he wrote, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I I know many of you know that verse, but I feel that that is a powerful verse for tonight's study because this is exactly what the queen is doing. She's seeking to find out the Lord, the name of the Lord behind the fame of, of Solomon. You've you got to remember, and we'll point this out in a minute, that King Solomon and Queen of Sheba, well, well, they know what it is to have much. They know what it is to have servants serve them. They know what it is when people respect them. But she is seeking the one who is, instead of behind Solomon, that is above Solomon. She, she's seeking to find out of the Lord that he serves. It says here that she came to test him with hard questions. And I kind of like that. Uh, I think possibly to her they were hard questions, but to Solomon, as he answered them, they were not so hard. They were easy. For as we know, the Spirit of God was upon Solomon at this time. Solomon had the Holy Spirit of God upon him. And so he was prepared to answer the questions that the queen came to ask. And it's good to ask questions. And by the way, you know, we are told to be ready in season and what? And out of season, that's right. We are always to be ready. 1 Peter 3.15, I like the NIV, the way it writes, it says, uh, to, uh, to revere, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness and respect. 
People don't need, I got my big Bible here tonight because my glasses broke on me. So I'm wearing some other glasses. But people don't need a big old Bible being beaten over their head. People don't need weird. We get enough of weird. They need someone to explain to them both with gentleness and respect. It's an honor when someone is asking us of our faith. We don't need to try to win the argument, do we? We want to win the heart. And we can't stand on truth, but we know the truth. And if they're seeking, that tells me that their hearts are hungry, that, that they're really, you know, a pa- you know, just ready and open for truth because they've been given lies already. So I think this is good. It's good for Solomon, and it's good for us to be ready in season and out of season. Here she comes, as Scripture tells us in verse 2, that she came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, which means an entourage, a, a large royal procession along with her, with camels that bore spices, very much gold, precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her what? Her heart. All that was in her heart. She could care less really with all of this pomp and circumstance and this retinue and and all these things that she brought. She wanted to speak to the king from her heart. She came with much stuff, surrounded with many people. She was the queen, for crying out loud. She was the queen of Sheba, but even the queen could feel alone. In the midst of this entourage, with all the gold and all the stuff, the queen was alone, poor and empty. She came with a heavy heart and again, full of questions, seeking the true God. She came seeking, guys, because none of this stuff satisfied her. Who knew that even if many of her servants just didn't respect her just for the title rather than who she really was, a person who had a heart that was empty. The heart is the seat of our emotions. The heart is where our true identity formulates. We are born with a void in it. If you do not think so, then parents, think back to when you brought your little sweet baby home. Or even some of you who have newborns, even toddlers. We don't teach them the word mine. We don't don't raise them to wake us up at 2 a.m. because they want to be changed and they're hungry. They are constantly a needy precious baby and we're given that responsibility of attending to them and and loving on them but there will come a time when that sweet baby that sweet child will come to those crossroads we talked about and we are on constantly not only are to feed them and to pamper them and to love them but to also to show them the way the truth and the life to make sure that they know beyond a shadow of a doubt who their maker is and more importantly, who their savior is. So here we see that uh, as they're born, we are all born with a void. We're born with our hearts in constant need and constantly needing to be filled, man. God, our maker, is the only one who can fill that void. He's the only one who can bring that joy that we talked about on Sunday morning. He's the only one who can bring fulfillment in life. Jesus, the Son of God, who brings salvation uh, for us, is is the only one who can bring that joy in life. And so here she comes with this heavy heart. Verse 3 says, So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for the king 
that he could not explain to her. I love that. Solomon, of course, probably saw it as a challenge. But again, at this point, he's still walking with the Lord. As I said, the Holy Spirit is still with him. And Jesus tells us, you and I today, who are believers in Christ, he tells us of our helper, the Holy Spirit, who not only is upon us, but in us, around us. It is that Holy Spirit, uh, when he comes to live within our heart, is the one who will help us. When, at, when we come into a situation where we need to give an answer. You know Luke 12, 11 and 12 where uh, Jesus says, Now when they bring you to the synagogues and the magistrates and authorities, he says, Do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should uh, say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. The Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. And that's true. The general idea of what Christ has said here is true for all of us. When we're asked about our faith, when we're asked, quote, hard questions. And you know what? It's okay to say, I don't know. If you don't know, don't, don't, don't come up with something weird. If you don't know the answer, tell that person, you know what? I don't know the answer. I can find out for you. I don't know the answer. Or if you're on the streets and you're witnessing and they ask you a question, and a lot of times it's not so much a hard question. It's just one of those trick questions. You just say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that, but what I do know is this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. You need to understand that. Turn, this, turn that question around and let them be challenged by the Holy Spirit in that scripture that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's just a, a little tip for you. We're moving on in verse 4 through 7. Here we see the queen is not only there to ask questions, but she's there to observe And verse 4 says, And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers, and here it is, guys, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. She not only came to test him with hard questions concerning the name of the Lord, but the queen came to observe, and what she saw, she caught. The servants, the waiters, the cupbearers, she knew she had the same things. She had the same loyal servants herself. But what she caught, Or we could say, what was the secret behind Solomon's true wisdom and true wealth? Please don't miss this. Was his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord. At this time, Solomon says, walking with Lord. And as Daniel, we see in his life, it was just his normal, everyday obligation that he would make to the Lord. She caught Solomon going into the house of the Lord to worship God. To go to the house of the Lord and to worship the Lord God. That, that is what was missing from all the other entities. She, yeah, the, the food on the table, we, we read about it, you know, There was just massive food. There was great servants, loyal folks around Solomon. She had the same thing. But what she didn't have was the Lord of whom Solomon served. And that's what was missing. And it says when she saw this, there was no more spirit in her. I like that. 
Her breath was just taken away. There was just no more spirit within her. What she saw and what she, what she heard affected her. It took her breath away to see God's blessing on Israel and the glory of the kingdom under Solomon. That's the key. That's your secret. Let you go and you worship the Lord. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, didn't he? Blessed are the bankrupt of one's own spirit, small s. Blessed are those who acknowledge the emptiness in one's heart and in the need to be filled. And that filling can only be fulfilled by God. He would say that for theirs is the kingdom of God. The person who comes to that point that realizes they're poor in spirit, if, if I can say that there was no more spirit within them, that they realized they came to a, a knowledge of the emptiness of that void we spoke of. He says, ah, they have access to heaven then. They are broken. And as you read the Sermon on the Mount, as you read the Beatitudes, they build one upon another. They become broken. They become, you know, uh, just uh, realizing uh, that they are empty. They become, um, you know, just broken and then hungering and thirsting for righteousness. He says they have access to heaven for theirs is the kingdom of God. And this, the queen saw all that has going on. It says there, and I love it, that she, you know, she just, her breath was taken away. There was no more spirit in her. Verse six, then she said to the king, it was true report. It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw it with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Isn't that heavy? Oh, I heard it. And then she responded to what she heard because she had to find out on her own. Everything is nice when you hear things. But the next step in hearing is by faith walking, responding, investigating, seeking. A personal visit became a personal investigation. And that's what the queen needed to really believe of what she only heard of from others. She wasn't impressed, I don't think, with, again, the, the, the gold and the silver. I'm sure, I'm sure the temple blew her away, no doubt. It would have blown anybody away. But, but she realized all of that is what well, she has herself. But what she didn't have was that relationship that Solomon had with God. She realized that what she really needed was the God that Solomon served. You know, it's interesting. She said, I, I heard this. Uh, I heard this true report, but I had to really seek it on my own. She says again, I came and saw it in verse 7 with my own eyes. And that reminded me of John chapter 4. In the 39th verse, again, Jesus with the woman at the well, when she realized that the Messiah was the one that speak, spoke to her, she no longer needed the water from the well. She leaves her pot there and she goes into the city and she begins, whether she knew it or not, to become a witness of the Messiah, of Jesus. Her thirst was really, her spiritual thirst was taken care of in Christ's words to her. And now she went to tell the men of the city because that's all 
that she really could speak with. The women, they wanted nothing to do with her. But in John 4, 39, it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they went out to Jesus. They urged him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, And we know that this indeed, the Christ, the Savior of the world. You've you've got to respond to the shared word, to to the spoken word of those who are speaking spiritual words, scripture, truths of God's word into you into me. I have to respond one way or the other, especially those who have yet come to Christ. Responding to God, you know, and when you do, you know, the old I won't believe until I see it kind of deal. But it's really here we see that, yeah, what the woman said urged them to go seek of themselves and when they got there they realized it was truth. So too with the queen of Egypt, or uh, the queen, I should say, uh, of, uh, of Sheba, not Egypt, but Sheba. Again, verse 7 in the latter portion, he says there that your, your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Verse 8, happy are your men and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom? Again, we were told that Solomon exceeded all of, at that time all who who ever had any kind of wisdom. His 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 wisdom, his prosperity, uh, the peace that he brought to Israel. It was just beyond anyone who ever had ever spoken or given forth word from this man because it came from God. Uh, First Kings 4, um, 28, 29 says, And God gave Solomon wisdom, exceedingly great understanding, and a largeness of heart like the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all men, verse 30 of First Kings 4. Of all men, all men of the east, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men. And she is witnessing that. And the queen says, oh, how happy, how blessed are those who are your servants. Who stand continually before you and your wisdom. She's seen the effect of the wisdom, the effect of Solomon's uh, relationship with God now that had upon his own servants. Such great wisdom for one man to have. And yet in Matthew, Jesus in Matthew 6, he asks us a question. Which of you by worrying can add one cubit or really one hour to his stature? And it's more, not so much in in our height, but in length of one's life. Matthew 6, 28, So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Look to my creation, Jesus says. Look to the creation. You know, like the old saying, we don't see a, a tree who gives forth its fruit, you know, uh, uh, no, we don't. We, no, it just gives forth. We don't see a lily as beautiful as a lily is, you know, toil or spin or get into a, a tizzy. No, it just comes forth, comes out of the ground, he says. And yet I say to you that even Solomon and all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Solomon with all his wealth and 
all his glory and all his wisdom. Exceeding the wisdom, exceeding the glory, exceeding because God blessed them the, the, the gold and the silver and all what man would die for. Exceeding all of that, he said, wasn't dressed as beautifully as that lily of the field. See, God sees the heart. God blesses. God blesses us all. Many of us have our own homes or apartments that we can live in. We have a job that one day we can go back to, or some of you have. God has blessed us as a church with a sanctuary, a building, really. And we're, we're, we, we, we thank him daily for that. We, we thank him that we have food on the table. We thank him that we have clothes that we can wear. But it's not about that. It's not about worrying. It's not about, you know, we're, Jesus said, listen, if, if God has arrayed the lilies of the field, who don't, you know, toil or spin, how much more is he going to provide for you? As Solomon was so splendidly dressed and the wealth that he had, well, how much more does God care for us? He cares for us, guys. Just always remember that. We're looking there at, at uh, in verse 9. Notice it says there, blessed be the Lord your God. Now, now the queen comes up with her own uh, beatitudes, if, it were, if you would. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel, because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you queen, king, to do justice and righteousness. I love that. She, she's, she's here placing a blessing upon Solomon, a blessing upon, you know, Israel. How the Lord, she sees how the Lord has loved them in her time there with Solomon. She sees that they're blessed people, that they serve the true God, that God even made him king for justice and righteousness. She was seeking something beyond Solomon when she came. And I believe this statement, this statement reveals that the queen had come to know the true God. I believe that. I, I believe that, that the king here uh, came and what she came to find, she found. What she came seeking, she found, I should say. She found what she was looking for. Jesus talked about the queen of Sheba and used her name as an example of people who want to find out the truth and will do anything to figure out the truth. Will seek it out, ask hard questions, observe, watch, witness, and respond. In Matthew 12, 42, Jesus said, The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation, he said, and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. See, Jesus knew the scriptures. And he knew this, uh, this, this set of scriptures that we're reading tonight. He knew this situation. He knew this event. And yet he uses it as a reference here against those who of yet who are rejecting him and yet to believe in him. The queen of Sheba went to great length, Jesus said. It was a 1,200-mile trip to be exact. 1,200 miles to seek out the truth in Jerusalem. And she found it through the words and the witness of Solomon and his servants. She found what she was looking for. Yet Jesus says a greater than Solomon, another son of David, came from heaven to earth. You want to talk great length? He came to earth from heaven. He didn't think it was robbery that he would have to come to earth to be a man, to die for man, to give them eternal life, to complete man. You want to talk about length? Because he is the greater than Solomon. He came to heaven, from heaven to earth. He came to bring truth. He came uh, to his own. And however, they rejected Jesus. You see, they weren't quite as interested in finding out the truth as was 
the queen of Sheba. And that's why Jesus says that she, the queen, will rise up in judgment with this generation, he says, and condemn it because she was exposed to a lesser light of truth than they were. I like what Guzik said, greater light requires greater judgment. The Jews of Jesus' day had the greater light, the light himself, Jesus, was right before them. Greater light than the queen, and yet by faith she believed. That's why she can stand in judgment against those who have rejected him. By the way, uh, I was going to share this on Sunday. There's, a, a, I guess, a, an acrostic or an acronym, whatever you want to say, on, on faith, F-A-I-T-H. It's forsaking all I take him. Forsaking all I take him, faith. So anyway, if some of you are into that. I thought I'd share that with you. It's over verse 10, it says, then, then she gave the king, you know, 120 talents of gold. That's four and a half tons. This was just protocol. This is what kings and queens and countries did. Uh, spices in great quantities, precious stones. Uh, there never again came such an abundance of spices as the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Also the ships of Hiram, which brought gold from Ophir, brought great quantities of almug wood and precious stones from Ophir. And the king made steps of almug wood for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Also harps and stringed instruments for the singers. And there never again again, came such almug wood, nor has the like been seen to this day. And so just basic protocol, the queen brings these things um, you know, the other king brings these great, um, you know, things from there, these precious stones and, and, and stringed instruments. It was just something that they would do to bless one another. But it really shows, again, her, uh, just the joy, the, the, the great joy of her heart in wanting to bless the king with many of these things. But as we wrap this up, look at verse 13. It says, now, now the king Solomon gave the queen of Sheba all she desired. Whatever she asked, besides what Solomon had given her according to the royal generosity. So she turned and went to her own country, she and her servants. Guys, this is the way one should leave after an encounter with God as this queen had a satisfied heart, a full heart, a full heart, a heart that is no longer looking to be filled with stuff. She had stuff, but is now filled with truth of the true God and how God takes someone like Solomon and blesses him with all wisdom and trust to lead Israel and be a light to the nations, her nation. To come and seek, to find and leave filled. Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord. The word delight means to be filled with luxury. There is no greater luxury than having the Lord in your life. It says, and he will give you the desires of your heart. It's only when we are completed and satisfied in the Lord that we'll be able to properly enjoy what we have been given That is the desires of our, because the desires of my heart, listen, when I'm in a relationship with God, Jesus Christ, the desires of my heart are the desires of my Lord. I align with my Lord, what he loves, what he wants for me, for us. His desires become my desires. And that is such a sweet blessing. Well, with that, we look to the Lord's table And we thank him. We thank him that he has saved us. We thank him that he has invaded our heart, that he has given to us the Holy Spirit, our helper, our helpmeet, the one who helps us all the time, daily, the one who empowers us to get through a day. It's all because of what Jesus did. 
but because we responded to his love on the cross. And he came to die for us. And prior to his death, as you know, he shared with his, with his disciples what he was going to go through. And he illustrated it through bread and the cup. And with the bread, he says, this is my body given to you. My body will be broken. I will go to the cross. I will pay for your sins. I will pay a debt I don't owe, but a debt you can't, you could never pay except through me. So Jesus, we thank you for that and we partake of the bread. Then next, as we're told, he took the cup. And as we know, he, he related this cup not only to his blood with the, co- with the color of what wine would be or grape would be, but he also said it's the cup of the new covenant, the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace that removes any kind of religion, religiosity, any kind of wall, any kind of man between God and man, so we can personally go to him, speak to him, worship him, honor him, and receive him as Savior and Lord. It was the cup that he said, this is the cup of my body, the cup of my blood given to you. And in all this, he wants us to remember him. So let us do that. Father, we thank you for giving us your only begotten son. You only had one son, and you gave him for us. And they tortured him on that cross, God. They tortured him because of our sins. He paid a price, God, for us. We know the penalty of sin is death and he came and he and he paid that penalty he paid the ransom that Satan had on us that our sins binded us in so thank you Jesus for your obedience continue to teach us guide us and direct us watch over us we ask it in your precious name amen